Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Red Bull Music Academy Weekender in Belfast. Um, it's really great to kick off the lecture today with the fantastic Terry Hooley. Terry Hooley, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren, for a lovely introduction. I usually introduce myself as the biggest wanker you've ever met. <laughs> Surprised anybody turned up. I'm glad to say I was a bit worried about that. The other thing I was a bit worried about was when they said a lecture. I don't like to be lectured at and I don't like to lecture to anybody, so I'm quite glad it's a question and answer thing. And the other thing is, anybody wants to ask me anything, feel free. I'll try and tell you the truth and not run off on a million tangents. Tell you a story. Start with a story in the last three years. Uh, well, this can't last three years, this is an hour and a half, but we'll do our best to cover as much as possible. Um, so, I thought, seeing as we're in Belfast and we're speaking to you, your own story and the story of Belfast run in almost a perfect tandem. So, I thought I'd kick off with a track that kind of is the very beginning for you. <laughs> Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise No better tune. <laughs> so, can you give us a little bit of a background about that particular track and its story for your life because it's tied into quite a, a pivotal moment in your young life? It's really funny because I used it at the opening of Good Vibrations, the film. And I'm a huge Hank Williams fan, and, and now a lot of young people are coming up and asking me to play it, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is great. Hank Williams was a great singer songwriter, and most of his work was done three years and he died early and he, but he left a legacy just everybody I mean loads of people have recorded and still recording Hank Williams songs uh, but it's my first musical memory because at the age of six I lived in East Belfast in a place called Garnival Estate in a prefab bungalow and it got my eyes shut out and then when the ambulance came and I put bandages around my two eyes and it was a lovely sunny day and I could see the light and they were putting me into the the ambulance, and I was thinking, these guys are crazy, because I, I could walk in the ambulance myself, and all I could think of was Hank Williams, I Saw the Light. So BBC, many, many years later, phoned me up and went, is it true that the grandfather of punk uh, <laughs> was a big Hank Williams fan? I said, I absolutely am. And they said, um, would you like to come in and talk? It's his birthday tomorrow, and I went, I'd love to. And I told that story, and a woman got in touch with the BBC and wanted to know how to get in touch with me. Because they didn't know where I first heard it, and it turned out that, well, her aunties ran a guest house in Botanic Avenue. And my grandfather was, uh, used to go around and collect on a Friday money, a donation for, for the church, because we because were running the guest house, it didn't go. And I think even Jean Vincent from in that guest house, but I'm not quite sure about that. Anyway, one Friday, I went round and put on that record, and I begged him and begged him and begged him to play it again and again and again. So that's where I found out eventually where I first heard it. And Stuart Bailey, sitting there just back from Nashville, gave me his father's uh, 78 copy for a uh, Christmas present there. It's one of the few things I'm allowed to put up on the wall in my girlfriend's house. After eight years, I was allowed to put up two awards and and, uh, and Stuart 78. <laughs> I've got the food in the door now. <laughs> so you finally got um, a copy of it to hand and well, framed it's just, on your it's wall. Well, it's just beautiful to see it and it's in really good condition, you know, because it just reminds me of, you know, uh, I used to go to people's houses, especially in the 60s. Uh, I love all kinds of music. I'm very passionate about music. Uh, 
I mean, I'm not a musical snob, far from it. Everybody thinks I'm beat. <laughs> I love some of the most ridiculous records in the world. But um, uh, I used to go, and all these girls, it was like the 60s, and it was the Stones, it was the Beatles, it was a really exciting time. And I'd be pulling out their dad's Charlie Parker albums, or Paganini, and Nina Simone, and Ella Fitzgerald. And I go, why, why are you playing my mum and dad's record collection? It's just I was always really interested to see to read the covers, to see who recorded it. It was fanatical, really. I was a bit of a, a record collector's nerd at the time. I'm not so much now, but I was, I was definitely then. So you were quite the record collector nerd from early on. Did yeah. you get that from your father? No. Uh, the, the greatest thing, well, we lived, it was, we were, we were less very, very poor, and everybody was in those days. Uh, but the first record I ever actually owned the day I became a record collector, I have still got unbelievable three divorces, been, been burnt out. Uh, and it was a Summer County free flip-flop record. And the guy came down the street and he put one through our letterbox and I ran after him and I, asked, I begged him for one and he gave it to me. Because I knew my brother, even though he didn't really want it, he wouldn't let me have the other record because he was a bit mean, actually. Just, I was, don't want to talk ill to the dead, but he's the right bastard. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I, I, I hid it in the earring cupboard under the towels. And, I, and I, for months, I just would go in and lock myself in the bathroom and read all, all the words. And I invented a game. So I did. And it was uh, Terry Hooley, Stuart Bailey, and I'd count all the T's on the records and you got a point for each T, T and then S for Stuart. And then to see who would win. Or, and I'd do this with all my friends' name. And then one day, a friend asked me, would I give him a hand with a chair to go around to his auntie's house? And she had a record player. And then I heard it for the first time. It was uh, Swinging on a Garden Gate by Humphrey Lilton, who is a great jazz musician, because jazz was the music of my youth. And when I heard it for the first time, I thought, Jesus, this is just wonderful. And that was my very first record that I ever got. And I didn't even have to steal it. <laughs> Look, uh, da there's, uh, well, David Holmes, the famous DJ, he, he wrote in my book, the original bit was, Terry, uh, give me all these 60s soul records and all these things. And I think he stole them from somebody who was in prison. I said, David, what are you on about? I might steal your girlfriend. I might steal your drink. I might steal your drugs but I'd never steal your record collection. No way. <laughs> so um, even from early on, music was such a massive part of your life, but I know that, um, as well as records, radio was a big part of your life. Yeah. Um, I know that your dad uh, bought you your first radio when you were, were six years old. He brought it back from a trip. Well, no, my dad was uh, very left. Uh, my mum was very Christian. My father was English, and, and he came, they met you met in the war in Shaftesbury Square. And, uh, oh, my grandfather didn't like my dad much at all, and neither did my uncles. So, and my grandfather pleaded with my mum the day that they got married not to marry him. It was a real lefty, and they were all orange. <laughs> and, and uh, but my mum married my dad, and she went to England. She didn't like it, so she left and came back home. So I lived a lot with my grandparents' house, which was great, because they had a big piano, and all my, I was in love with my aunties. And as a bit of a mummy's boy, you know, hanging on to my mum's apron strings. And uh, everybody would sit round and sing around the piano and all and perform. It was just magical. And then we got the Winter Carnival. And then my mum and dad would go out to Labour Party meetings at night. And I'd sneak out of bed and listen to Radio Luxembourg uh, fanatically and uh, hear all this wonderful music and American forces overseas to hear the blues and the soul. And then my father went to Sweden on a trade union gig and uh, out there and he brought me back my first transistor radio and that was heaven to me to be able to hear music anywhere to be it was just like fantastic i did have what was called a crystal set which was he used the the frame of the bed as an aerial and it was old ex-army headphones and and it was very limited but to be able to walk about carrying and listening to music was just magical for me and it um, may seem a bit hard to believe with uh, a lot of younger people in the room, but it really was, in a lot of respects, the only way to hear music 
was through the radio, um, through like Radio Luxembourg and Radio Caroline. What sort of records were you exposed to? Because I would imagine not having that lot much choice, what you were exposed to that either absolutely loved or absolutely hated. So what kind of records are really catching you from a young age listening to the radio? Well, I remember listening to uh, American radio overseas broadcast. It was really for the German, American troops in Germany. And I, I'm just back from San Francisco. And I heard this record one night. I didn't know who it was. I didn't catch who it was. And it was called San Francisco Bay Blues. I've got the blues from a baby down by the San Francisco Bay. Ushala, gone so far away. I didn't mean to treat her so bad. Best girl I ever had. And it was just an amazing record to me. And it took me a while to find out who it was. But it also took me a while to track it down. And that was like one of the first records I think that I ever sent away for. So, and... Uh, Eric Clapton did a version on his MTV Unplugged album and brought it to, that song to a different generation. And then I found out that Bob Dylan had stayed with Jesse Fuller, who was a bit of a one-man band. He had actually come and played Belfast, but I was too young to go. Uh, and uh, Eric Clapton did quite a good version, I must admit, and I, I turned it, that song on to another. And I never thought I'd ever be to San Francisco, and there I was just away last week. Everything comes full circle. That song going through my head. Um, so when it came to, like you said, the relationship between your mum and your dad, uh, I know that your mum uh, took you to Methodist Church when you were younger and you'd be exposed to gospel music, and then you were listening to these things on the radio. How do you think growing up that had an impact on your taste as you'd become a teenager? Well, uh, <laughs> I love gospel music. Uh, my mum would take me to church on a Sunday morning. She's a Sunday school teacher at church. We weren't allowed to play on a Sunday. We had to wear a Sunday best, and we weren't allowed to get anything dirty. And Sundays were, for me were pretty boring. But I do actually love the gospel. I think it's because of my Methodist upbringing. There's a bit of that in me. Because um, I, I like the singing in the churches. That was the, the bit, a bit of church that I liked was the singing. And I used to go to uh, Baptist churches because they used to have tambourines and stuff. Uh, because I enjoyed that, and I remember one night going to this Baptist hall, and uh, and I go, there's a sinner here, there's a sinner here that has it once, and I, and I and they came up to and they went to me, and I went, no, no, just only here for the music, and never went back. <laughs> so I like I like a lot of American gospel music. I mean, I like lots of music, but what really I was really I got a job at the Hearst Gamains at the side of City Hall in the photographic exhibition, because music and photography were my great loves. And then I got to know the reps who would come to the record shop on a Friday. And then that was their last call of the week, and they'd give me all these free records, demonstration records. I was just in heaven. And then I was doing DJ. I started doing DJ when I was 15 in a youth club, and then I started doing DJ. And then I would have a record which wasn't released for weeks and it'd be Terry's tip for the top and I can remember lots of them it was like I can Tina Turner's River, Deep Mountain High, um, Percy Sledge when a man loves a woman. Just and every week I'd have a Terry's tip for the top. And it was never a Terry's tip for the top, but it was never in the top ten. Which was amazing. A very underground of you. Um, I suppose one of the one of the main things that strikes me about um, you getting into music early on and feeling uh, an affinity with gospel music is how that and also informed your taste for kind of classic R&B music. Um, and I've got a track for you that I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about. Past. Past. Well now, let me tell you about the past. The past is filled with joys and broken toys, laughing girls and teasing boys. Was I ever in love? I called it love. I mean, it felt like love. There were moments when, well, there were moments when. Present. beach tonight? I'd love 
to. But don't try to touch me. Don't try to touch me. Because that will never happen again. Shall we dance? Just when it was getting a bit dramatic. Um, well, it is a sort of three-minute perfect uh, rock opera. It's got uh, <laughs> Moonlight Sonata, Beethoven there. It's got uh, in it, Tisket and Tasket, which I love Ella Fitzgerald's version. And it's also like a coffin rock record as, as well. But it's, I, was a, I was a fanatical uh, Shango Les fan. And Ronettes, The Crystals, Supremes, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. I uh, just loved all the girly groups, chiffons, joke, don't even start me on the Shirelles. <laughs> well, I was and, uh, hoping to start you. And uh, I used to torture my mum to death, and uh, especially with the Shangri-Las. My, my first girlfriend was uh, killed in a car accident, coming back from a party in Bangor. The night I was out <laughs> painting anti-Vietnam War uh, slogans around Belfast, and she went to this party and she was killed on the way back. And I used to sit in my bedroom. I just thought I'd never be with anybody again. My mum used to hear me crying in bed at night. I used to sit in the bedroom and play this. Uh, I was quite a lonely kid. Uh, uh, my brother was a bit nasty and he wouldn't let me play with anybody he knew and stuff. And I, so in the, when I got my own record player, one in six weeks, paid off every week, Kay's catalogue, dance set. Um, and I had my own records, so just sort of lived in a sweet world of my own in the bedroom. And the records were my best friends. And then the, the I was asked about 40 years ago, uh, what was my all-time favorite record? And I said, well, it's Past, Present and Future by Shangle. I said, I love that record. And I thought, oh, that's a bit wimpy, you know? Like, All right, okay. Should have been like something like Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf or something. But, uh, and at the time, I must say, if you ask me today, I would say, that, yes, it's a very personal record for me. And it's very part of my growing up. And I was in New York 18 years ago. And uh, somebody told me, I love Ch George Shadow Morton, the producer. He produced the Dixie Cups. He produced a lot of great stuff. And uh, he, uh, I was, somebody said to me, his, his phone number's in the New York phone book. Why don't you phone him up? And I went, I just be like a stalker, you know, I feel a bit bad about it. And then this girl gave me uh, Mary Weiss, the lead singer of the Shangri-La's number, and said, why didn't you phone her up? And I went, a bit shy about that. And if you've anybody seen the story of Good Vibrations, and it's like giving Sarah away, uh, giving the other turns away to Sarah for nothing, and, and the deal was to was get an autograph photograph of the Shangri-La's, and I never got it. And Mary Weiss sent me an email one day. David Holmes had got in touch with her. And she sent me an email, and I was sitting at home on Friday afternoon. And I, Mary Weiss, I said, that can't be Mary Weiss, they'd sing the shangle. So I went and made myself a cup of tea with a brandy in it. And I sat there, should I open it up? And I opened it up, and there was, a, there was a message from her. And uh, she says, Terry, what is it you want me to autograph? So, and I sort of sent her a few lines, then she sent me a few lines, and then I told her why I loved the shangri last and, and I thought, better, I'm writing my life story here, I better stop. And they were going to fly Mary Weiss over from New York. To, her mother had found in her, in her loft an autograph poster, of all the band, because some of the band are dead. Uh, and Mary was sending it to me, and uh, Said to David Holmes, and then they were asked her, would you come over to Ulster Hall for the opening? And to tell you the truth, see if Mary Weiss had to come to Ulster Hall that night, I wouldn't have let her go back to America. <laughs> She's still not a bad looking woman, I tell you. <laughs> but I was madly in love with her. I was madly in love with all the shangles, but I was a big Ronettes fan, and I used to carry in my pocket uh, a cutout of the enemy, it was a photograph of Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes. And then years later, my good friend John T. Davis were talking one night, 
And didn't he do exactly the same? He had a cut-out photograph from a pub magazine and carried about when he was a school kid. So another thing that we have in common. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just wonderful. And, uh, you know, I never even thought I'd be in correspondence with Mary Weiss. And I uh, hope to meet her someday. Oh, well, thanks very much for sharing that. She, she, really could, she could be a future Mrs. Hooley. <laughs> with any luck. Um, but no, I was also playing that because, like you say, in the film For Good Vibrations, um, you agree to pass on your rights, as it were, um, for the undertones Teenage Kicks, for the princely sum of £500, a signed photo of the Shangri-Las. But I love that, you know, £500 will come and go, but a signed photo of the Shangri-Las is forever. So I like that I'm sentiment. I'm actually thinking of doing... People keep asking me... I'm going to... Well, <laughs> it's a funny thing. I was thinking that... Um, I would get some copies made for a few friends and I went to look for it in the house, they can't find it. But I know it's in the room somewhere. I just haven't looked properly. Is that is this room in the house? And if I set it hang down, Claire puts it in the room. And I go, I was reading that letter, what happened to it? I said I put it in the room. And everything's in the room. I know it's definitely safe, but I, I'm gonna have to there's just CDs and records and just everything in this room. It's just like it needs a good Clear, clear out, but I'll, I'll get to it one of these days. I can imagine there's a lot of treasures in there. Um, I was mostly... Actually, uh, uh, ten years ago when it burned out of a fire, I lost uh, an autographed Johnny Cash photograph that uh, I'd got off him in London. And uh, I, after Johnny died, I, I took it down because people wanted to buy it off me. And I said, no, I'm not so. And then it went up in the fire. And then recently in my guise, I was looking for something else for something and didn't I find an autograph Johnny Cash and June Carter photograph, which I didn't even know I had, so that was a nice surprise. Collecting signed photos as much as collecting records at this point. Well, I used to be a bit of a, an autograph hunter and the Kings, Stones, everybody, when I was younger. Um, so yeah, I was partly playing that record as well because um, pop music and like classic American R&B pop music is such a, a, a fine red thread, as it were, throughout the whole feel of good vibrations. It was punk rock, but it had a very pop accessible feel to a lot of things. Yeah. And uh, I thought the Shangri Las was a good example of that. Um, and it was also really interesting how um, like contemporary black music at the time from the States was very much a part of your taste and that informed what the label went on to become. Um, and on that kind of note, I'm gonna play a track and hopefully um, it will spark a memory of you from 1968. Knock it off, I've yeah. been told. Knock it off. Um, well, that uh, 60s to me were just... I was born at the right time, the right place. I'm 65 now. So I was born in 1948. And then just uh, the, the rock and roll th whole thing changing. And then, well, the 60s. And I think the Beatles... I mean, I'm a huge Rolling Stone, was a huge Rolling Stones fan, fanatic. And... Never, I love the, what the Beatles did, but I'm not a fanatical Beatles fan. But the Beatles did change everything. 
And for, for me as a teenager growing up in the 60s was absolutely just the most amazing experience in Belfast. We had a, it was, the rationing was over. We were, were, people were starting to have a bit of money. Um, youth culture was really changing everything. The music was changing. Uh, and a lot of, I mean, if you go back and look at the Stones and the Beatles and a lot of bands that were doing covers of uh, American records. And I was the secretary, well, I was running a, I was running a folk club, <laughs> uh, Sabine in High Street. And then it sort of closed down and Dougie Knight asked me would I like to run the blues club uh, in a shop on a Sunday night. And believe it or not, in the 60s, on a Sunday, everything closed down. They... Uh, used to lock up the swings so the kids couldn't play. Uh, you just couldn't do anything on a Sunday. And we ran this club on a Sunday night in a shop, and we had maybe five artists on, and it was one and sixpence for girls, and, and two and six for boys, which was my idea. <laughs> and you got free coffee and biscuits and wonderful music. It was a great promotion for Dougie's shop. But we also put on concerts, of, and we brought over a lot of American blues artists, and the last concert we ever did was in November 1968, and that's just who you heard, was Duke Boy Bonner. And Belfast, there'd been trouble, and although there wasn't any rioting that night, but there was a fear of rioting, and the pubs all closed at six o'clock in the evening, and the town was deserted, and we were a bit worried, and we were a bit worried about getting Duke Boy Bonner down from the airport because we heard that roads were being blocked off and stuff. So it was in the, the concert was in the War Memorial building in Waring Street, which is just two minutes away. It's, it's a venue which is never used anymore. And so it was all a bit worried. But the blues crowd came out with a good crowd. Plus the fact it was the only place in Belfast City said you could get a drink. So we had the blues crowd and alcoholics. <laughs> And it was a good a tomato, night. tomato, at and, some point. And, and we'd done all this food to sell and all, but we'd just give it away to people. Uh, we were waiting to see if Duke Boy Bonner was coming. I put a friend, they had Emmett up on stage playing. And Duke Boy Bonner arrived down, and my friend Pauline jumped up and kissed him. He sort of mentions her in the song. And I gave him a big hug, and so glad he got such a warm welcome. And that was the night that I realized the party was over. And the 60s was one big party that thought would go on forever. And that was the night I realized, you know, Bob Dylan's right, the times they are a-changing. And that was the start of it. And then the 70s was just, in this country, was horrific. I didn't really, a lot of what didn't really do much. You know, it's just, we were afraid to go out. I mean, club bar we drank was bombed and friends had been killed and just, so we started staying at home a lot and partying in our house and if there was any trouble, you know, people just stayed the night. And I started selling records from my back bedroom. But uh, it wasn't until I had the shop in Hard Street that a friend of mine, well, his sister and I had been big friends in the Maritime Jazz Club and all the great venues. And he's very interested in that period. And he came in and he bought a Duke Boy Bonner CD in the shop. And I'd ordered up all these CDs, blue CDs, that were about to be deleted and stuff. And, and I'd ordered them all up. And, uh, and he came up with a copy of Duke Boy Bonner. And I went, we brought him to Belfast. He says, and there's a track on it called Belfast Blues. And that's, that must be 15 years ago. And I never even knew it existed. So apparently Duke Boy Bonner went over to London next, next week and, and put it down. And I never knew it existed until... Colin, uh, Colin Carson. So it was great just to hear that memory. And because my friend Pauline was raped and murdered in New York, she was my mentor. She's a lot older than me. She, she taught me to read and write, but she taught me a lot of bad habits too. And I never went back to church after meeting her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I became a right heathen. And, uh, and it was just such, she was so, it took pity on me because that I was, in the community. That's a, that's a three hour story, but uh, well, I saw this girl one night, my mate asked her, she was 10 years older, my mate asked to go out with her, and she said, uh, well, I might see you in this Belmont Tennis Club. I got all dolled up in my brother's teddy boy jacket, which just didn't wear the dances in those days. 
And I went to the gig and the girl never turned up and he's the girl said, are you trying to be a hard man? I said, no, I'm a pacifist, don't believe in violence. And I went and I told him a story and it sort of adopted me and invited me to this barbecue. And next thing I was drinking Guinness and brandy. Because it took me to this house and there was a party on and they asked me what did, what did I want to drink? And I didn't know. And I, all I said is, I'll have a baby sham because that was always on the TV. Yeah, Dad. <laughs> and Pauline just turned around and said, no, you're not. Guinness, Guinness and Porter, that's what you like. <laughs> God, I had the worst hangover ever. I swore <laughs> I'd never drink again. <laughs> no, um, that actually, that recording um, it is called Belfast Blues and it was recorded in 1969, so it would have been a year after the gig. Um, and it was on his 1970 oh, LP. I think it was um, because that was November 68 that he played that gig, so he would have recorded it a couple months later, but it was on um, a 1970 LP from some London sessions that he did. So I picked that partly because you were the secretary of the Blues Society at that yeah, time. It was the last gig that we ever did mm -hmm. yeah. as the Blues Society. Mm -hmm. It was all, I mean, it really, it was the end, end of a decade for me. The, the 60s had, Ended early, and it was just a, it was just a, a kaleidoscope of color, and fashion, and freedom, and you know we I mean our Friday night would be we would go to the Spanish rooms on the Falls Road, and five or six of us would buy a gallon of cider, and we'd drink it around the entry, and then we get one and six back in the container, then we would buy a pound deal of hashish from Joe Yak. And then we would go down to the Maritime Hotel to hear them. And that was just fantastic. One of the greatest bands ever to come out of Belfast, if not the, the greatest. And they, that was amazing. And many years later, I went back with a couple of 60s musicians to do a bit of filming for the old Grey Whistle Fest. And we couldn't believe how small it was. It was like the size of this room. Our memory of it was, it was like the Ulster Hall. And Mervyn Crawford, friend, he plays saxophone in our apartment. He said, God, look how tiny that stage is. My legs were shaking, going on. And we just could it was like somebody had built a wee facsimile of the, our memory of it was, it was huge. And, but it wasn't, it was just it was like this room, basically, maybe a bit bigger. And that, they were, that was fantastic. That was a fantastic club in the jazz. I and mean, there were 80 clubs in and around Belfast where you could hear live music. Unbelievable. And then when the troubles came, there was like two, mm -hmm. the pound and stuff. And, and, uh, I mean, the weekends were just bonkers. You just didn't get any sleep in the 60s, you know, it was like. Um, speaking of, of them, uh, I was also um, with the Belfast Blues track. It's, again, talking about the influence of things like the Shangri-Las, the influence of, like, contemporary black pop and R&B music on the sound. And I think when you're saying the end of the 60s, it was like a massive, like, social, political but also like a cultural a cutoff point um, when Belfast really became very insular, you know, um, of mostly of its, uh, not of its own volition. Um, and I thought I could play two tracks, well, parts of two tracks, uh, just to kind of exemplify the influence um, of R&B on what was happening in Belfast.
So I thought that was a nice correlation. Both of them are called Baby Please Don't Go, but I'd like to think that that was quite a good example of what we're speaking about, how, you know, the the big beat kind of rock bands like them with Van Morrison and then the influence of <coughs> pop and R&B from the wider world. But when it came to the end of the 60s, that very much felt like a cut-off point for you. Well, them, them, them were brilliant, but they weren't the only brilliant band in Belfast. There was lots of really great bands and... The influence was American black music, obviously, and Van's father had was, was a big record collector. His mum, Val, was a bit of a singer, and his father was in the, worked in the shipyards, was in the blues, jazz, country, and so which were obviously Van got a lot of his influences from. And because we were, the, the R&B explosion of the 60s was phenomenal. Um, Black artists like John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters and B.B. King were absolute gods to, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, but were hardly unheard heard of in America at the time. It's hard to believe. In fact, many people say it was uh, the British invasion that brought, brought black music back to America. Uh, and I used to be fanatical at checking out who wrote the songs. Uh, as I love uh, them's version of... Uh, don't Look Back, John Lee Hooker's song, one of my heroes. And uh, Don't Look Back to the Days of Yesterday, You Cannot Live on the Past. And when the trouble started, I used to start playing that a lot more, you know, Don't Look Back. Uh, because my my history didn't start in 1690. My history started around 65 in the jazz club. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my whole history of Belfast, really. Then... There was the political stuff as well. It was coming. Uh, I was I was help, quite helpful in getting Nina Simone, who was very political, over to do her only gig in Belfast in the late sixties when it was the time of the civil rights movement here. And uh, you know, because she's very political, but she's also a bit crazy, a bit like myself. You know? And uh, I thought she I always thought she was a wonderful artist. Also, a great album that came out. Uh, was and it's my all-time favorite record. Was what's going on by Marvin Gaye because I was very anti the Vietnam War, and that whole album, which which uh, uh, the head of uh, Motown didn't want to put out, and became their best-selling album ever, I think. Uh, and I remember reading one of the reviews, and it just said, "This is not a bad album." If you play it, I went, Jesus, it's the worst. And it's just my all-time favorite record. I could listen to it 24 hours a day. And it's got all sorts of stuff in it, um, but about ecology and all. And that was uh, also, I think Barry Gordy, the head of Motown, didn't want to put it because he thought it was a bit too political. But there's a lot of political black move, uh, music coming, uh, fantastic stuff coming out of America at the time. And a lot of it was, to, a lot of music, it was, you could wait to the civil rights movement in America. You could do, you could relate to it in Belfast. And Stuart and I were just talking on the, in the car on the way down here about some music and about somebody coming over and about the civil rights thing. And I said, well, songs like Go to Sleep, Weary Hobo, I love, but I always hated Go to Sleep, Weary Provo. I used to hate the way they would take a classic American folk song or something and turn it in. But um, just the troubles, just, I just wonder what it was all about now. It was just complete madness. It looked like our country was having a nervous breakdown. And we didn't go out much. And then one night, three gunmen was coming out of work and tried to grab me in a car. And two guys that used to tell me every day they hated my gut saved my life. And then I decided to set up good vibrations. I thought I might as well do something before they kill me. And I'd always been interested in music. And I started selling music from my house. Then I started doing the markets. And then eventually we got the derelict building in Great Victoria Street. And I wasn't sure how it would go. It seemed to go OK. But then we were going for a while. And a guy called Gordy Owens from Sandy Road came in and told me about this punk gig. 
and I went down there, and I was the most unlikeliest person in the world. I really was that happy. Um, I, I went down and I heard punk, and I heard the outcast play. Oh, I thought we're atrocious. Absolutely it, dreadful. It, that was um, a Rudy, a Rudy and the Outcast gig. That was yes. in 1978. Could well have been. Sure it could well it have been. Could have been. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. You're I've got Al no, I've got Alzheimer's coming in, kicking in. But I mean, I, I can remember things in the 60s so clear. Can't remember what I did last week, or, but um, I went down and I heard Rudy, and I, and I loved a lot of the the American garage bands, like you would see on the Nuggets compilation albums. Um, Seeds, the Standells, Electric Prunes. And Rudy did a great version of Question Mark and Mysterious, 1960, uh, 1960 Tears, 96 Tears. And I loved all that garage music, so it wasn't a great jump for me. To, to, and I liked the Ramones very much. It wasn't a great jump for me, but to hear something which was really exciting in Belfast, it just reminded me of my youth, going to hear them and all the bands. And I just thought, this is brilliant. And we didn't have an effective music industry here. So like them and all had to go to, to England to record and get deals and there's a lot of great bands here that should have had records out. So I, I went up to Rudy and went, do you want to make a record? And I just thought I was a madman. <laughs> and nine months later, I was the outcast manager in a record label. <laughs> and that was um, and that was the first release, Rudy's uh, a Big Time yeah. was the first release on Good Vibrations. We, did, we didn't have a clue how to put out a record or anything. Well, it sounded, it sounded pretty good. This is, um, this is how it sounded. Shame to cut it off in the middle of a, a riff, but uh, yeah, that was big time by Rudy. I don't know whether it's those speakers or not, but it sounded really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this it's possibly difficult for for somebody of my age group to understand um, hearing like punk anthologized as it has become, but in the context of Belfast at the time, there was you know basically a ghettoization of the city, you know. Bars were shutting at tea time. There were no venues open, um, and there was a, quite literally barricades. Yeah, a ring of steel around the city centre. A ring of steel around the city centre, and um, uh, I was listening to a really interesting uh, Baby's Radio Four um, interview with a woman recently who was who who claims to be one of these punks, and she said it was essentially a playground, well, a violent playground between the punks, the RUC, and the army. Yeah. Um, and I remember yourself saying that the punks basically saved Belfast. Well, uh, they opened up the nightlife again in Belfast. Started. Well, Jim Cusack, who was security, security correspondent for the Irish Times, knew quite a lot of it, and from Belfast, knew quite, he said it was Terry Hooley and the punks that opened up the nightlife in Belfast. I mean, I'm not that's absolutely sure that that's true, but we certainly definitely helped. And where we are in this area, the cathedral, I mean, the heart bar was just around the corner, which was a shit shithole, basically. I mean, it was a strip club during the day and then use it at night. And we we opened up the heart bar and it was, really was the first time in a decade where kids from, well, it didn't matter if you're Protestant, Catholic, didn't matter if your hair was orange or green, didn't matter if you came from Mars, as long as you were a punk. And not all punks were love and peace, far from it. I'm right, bastards. Uh, <laughs> and but I mean, a lot of people say to me, if it wasn't for the punk and all, we would have joined the paramilitaries, we would have killed people, we would have ended up in jail, we would have, you know. And 
it, it, it really did change a lot of people's lives. Not only my own, I mean Stuart, uh, anybody, but also a lot of the bands, uh, like Stiff Little Fingers, The Undertones and all. It was just a time of no hope. And punk was like, to me it was like a, a little candle, a little light in the darkness and this, and this sea of madness and, and the sectarian violence and craziness. Uh, and it was also very exciting. So it was really, really exciting. And Good Vibrations didn't have a great musical policy. Some people say that Terry signed the band up because he fancied their girlfriends or because they'd bought him a drink one night or something. It's probably true. <laughs> uh, but it was just, we hadn't a clue what we were doing. And the last thing we ever thought that anybody would ever remember any of this stuff. Uh, I mean, we just didn't have a clue. It was all new to us, how you made a record. And we sent Ru Rudy with a band that I really thought should have made it. I, and they were great. And if you watch the film Good Vibrations, you think that because I didn't put out a record, that was it. That was it. No, they left us and went to England and then came back and recorded for us again. And uh, so, and I begged him, I broke down and cried. And I said, don't go. And a friend of mine who had traveled with bands all over Europe, uh, he said, now listen to Terry. So Rudy, I think, just jumped the gun too quickly. Uh, and we were sort of going okay, and then the undertones were, was a big one, and that was just amazing. I went to London, and the first people I took it to was Rough Trade, and they were the biggest independent record distributors in the UK, and plus, in fact, a label. And it just signed up Stiff Little Finger. So I went down to Jeff Travis and Richard Scott. I got off the plane, I took it down, and I was all excited, and I played them really, I played them the undertones big time. And they told me it was the worst record they ever heard. <laughs> I was devastated. I mean, we recorded this at the back of the Duke of York in a clothing warehouse in a little studio for 200 pounds, 50 quid a track. So then I took it to EMI and a whole lot of other record companies. I'll tell you it was shite. And then on the last day, and it was my last hope, was CBS. And I went in there and they told me it was rubbish and I wrecked their office. <laughs> I was so frustrated. I was so angry. And then I went round and left copies to, to, and to John Peel in the BBC. And I came back. I went and got trashed that weekend in London with a lot of mates. And I was just, oh, I just went, and I, was, I didn't want to go home because I felt I'd really let the band down. I really believed in Teenage Kicks. I really thought it was a great pop record and very radio friendly and stuff. And I, I went got trashed and I didn't want to come home. And I come home, I was so disappointed that I'd let the band down. And I broke down and cried. Then my wife and I said, she said, maybe John Peel will play it, play it. And that night, he played it. And famously, for the first time ever in the history of the BBC, a, a, a record was played two times in a row, back to back. And then Sarah phoned me up. I got my home phone number, and they phoned me up. And I told him they wanted to license the record for America, actually. That was the, the thing. And I said, look, we're not really a proper record label. And my job isn't running a record club, but my job is to put Northern Ireland back on the music map, and that's all I want them to try to do. And I said, get over here on the Wednesday night. Uh, they're playing in Derry. So I came over and I heard them on the Wednesday night. And Thursday was signed. And on the Friday, because Peter Paul had put it out as his record of the week and all on Radio 1, and all the Radio 1 DJs were then playing it. CBS and EFI and all me up. And they wanted, they wanted, to, they wanted, the undertones, and I said, too bad to get signed to, signed to Sire yesterday. This CBS, who were particularly nasty to me, who asked why I wrecked their office, um, said, have you any other bands on the label? And I said, I have, but I wouldn't fucking give them to you. <laughs> and, um, but that's a really, the, the relationship that you, as you as Good Vibrations, than you personally have had with both independent labels and major labels over the years, including Rough Trade, Sire, EMI, it's very interesting to think of what is it the, the well, I, I don't actually like the music business. I like the music. Uh -huh. And I hate record companies. I sometimes I think they're legalized mafia. That's why I've never had a contract with anybody in my life. You know, I mean, well, should have. Actually, could, could be quite rich if I had it. <laughs> but, Just uh, think if I had a penny for every time that I had heard Teenage Kicks in my life, I'd be, be able to buy you all a drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I asked, I asked partly um, because... I'm curious as to what you think at the time, because by the time that the undertones were releasing, that was like 78, 79, um, like punk was quite an established um, a musical genre. You had it, uh, 
Sex Pistols on, you know, Top of the Pops, you know, The Clash were huge. So what do you think in particular it was about the Northern Irish punk sound that people at first were quite re rejecting of and then came to love? I think it's sort of a, a rawness to some of, some of the bands. Uh, you had it in the 60s too, you know, if you look at them and a lot of the bands, there was a, a sort of rough edge to the music. But also I think it meant something here to, to you know, people because they were getting out of their ghettos uh, and going to these wee places. I mean, as Stuart once wrote that no matter which tribe you came from, to go, you had to pass a lot of different areas and you know, to get to the hard bar. And, it was, and when you came down these streets 35 years ago at night, it was the scariest ending. There was just nobody about at all. Nobody. And the, it was scary. So then it might have been scary and the, the hard bar might have been rubbish. But when you got in and heard the music, it was just, it was just like going to see them again uh, for me. And I was very lucky. I got a chance to relive my youth. But there was a lot of, the, after Stiff Little Fingers did it, all, all the political stuff, a lot of the bands didn't want to write about the troubles, so they wanted to write what was happening in their life. And, and a lot of the bands avoided writing about the troubles, which I sort of think, you know, okay, it was a reaction against the troubles, but, you know, but I, I think it should be maybe more political songs at the time. Mm. But it, uh, nobody, nobody felt like doing it because Stiff Little Fingers had been such a tremendous success mm. with Suspect of Ice and Alternative Ulster <laughs> and, and stuff. And, but that, um, that kind of split, um, like in hindsight, there was kind of a thematic split in what was going on um, in the punk scene in Northern Ireland because then you have S Stiff Little Fingers who are actively writing about the troubles and then you had groups like the Undertones who are quite the flip of yeah. it where they were more about, well, from my perspective, obviously you can correct me if you think differently, but they were more about a kind of romantic escapism about their own teenage lives and yeah. trying to, because I remember um, reading something from Fergal Sharkey and he said, there is no way that a one-hour gig is going to squash 400 years of, you know, hatred and violence. It's about, the undertones were about escapism. Does that kind of chime with you? There was almost two yes. kind of sides to it. Well, I suppose if you lived in Derry at that time and you're a young person, you just went out and ratted every day after school and, and the undertones formed a band. And, they, and, the, and the reason why I thought they were so good in the studio was because they practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And when they went in the studio, they basically were recording them live. Basically, it was, uh, and they were that good. I always thought they were, and I, said, I think I think it for many bands is, some bands are very lazy. It's just to practice and practice and practice and practice till you get it right. And uh, because of Terry being sort of quite a violent city as well and stuff, I, th I think being in the band was like a safety net for them, you know, not getting caught up in all this. So it's hard to explain really, but uh, they were frightened to come down to Belfast because of all the sectarian murders and stuff. I mean, Rick, Mickey Bradley on the other tones a few here. years ago asked me to take not him round the corner and show him where he recorded Teenage Kicks. And his, his memory of it was like, they were really scared coming to Belfast. Yeah, I was going to say because um, the undertones are from, from Bogside in Derry. Aye. And uh, that was, um, you know, unfortunately, famously, you know, well known in the late 60s, early 70s for... Yeah, we were afraid know, to go up the Bogside. Rampant sectarian <laughs> violence, yeah. I was wondering um, also the way that the undertones portrayed themselves and how people reacted to them. Because now looking back, they're a very loved kind of Northern Irish pop pop and pop group. Um, but at the time, uh, I was quite struck to read that people were, were really quite hostile to them. They felt yeah. that they were kind of, there's, they, were tap, they were going against a, a quite typically Belfast thing of, you should know your place, I, I know who you are and, and where you come from. And their kind of aspirational kind of um, way of acting was seen as quite an antithesis to that. The, the night that I uh, we took Sarah up and stayed in Mrs. Sharkey's house <coughs> in the guest room, which was like a religious goddle. So it was, I mean, it was like going to Lourdes or something. <laughs> and, uh, and it was like, Jesus, I love all this stuff. And uh, the next day I went down to get some cigarettes and a paper from the shop with Fer and Fergal came with me. And people ran across the road and spat on him. And I went, 
What on earth is that all about? In Belfast, nobody could be bothered to run across the road and spit on somebody, I don't think. And I was really, that really shocked me. I was sort of quite taken aback about that. And people had put up, it only just started, people had put up graffiti that didn't like, um, didn't like the band. And, and, but uh, I think they just got used to it after a while. I know Fergal took a lot of flack, so he did personally. And then there was in the music press about stiff little fingers and the undertones not liking each other and stuff like that. Uh, but, um, there were a lot of great bands. I mean, one of, one of the bands that I really loved was the Reflex and some of their stuff was political. They were from the Shankill Road. Um, I mean, there, if I turned the band down, I used to go, Terry only sing, signs up Protestant bands from East Belfast, which is far from a truth. Uh, I'm not well liked in East Belfast, so I'm not. Because I like all kinds of people. Just uh, the, we didn't really know what we we're doing, but and it was real cottage industry. So it was we were, we all folded each other's sleeves. We all we all uh, and unfortunately we went bankrupt because a lot of the uh, small independent distributors loved to sell our records and all, but they never wanted to pay us. And then a lot of them went bust, and then we went bust because we couldn't pay our bills. And I was quite glad when eventually, I was sort of quite relieved because it was three years, for about three years of my life, it just seemed to like be madness and no sleep. And kids would be coming, knocking on my door at three o'clock in the morning with a demo and it's just bonkers. And I, th and I think I just basically ran out of energy. So I was sort of quite glad. And the other thing is because we were such a small label, nobody really remembers some of the rubbish records that I put out. Um. And not to pick a rubbish record, because I wouldn't do that, but there is one particular record um, on the Good Vibrations uh, label that I find really interesting. It was the only 12-inch the only single that you ever put out, and I was hoping um, to do a little segue into another side of this. I'm going to play this, and hopefully you can tell me a little bit about it. Could you tell us a little bit about that record? Well, I've, I've, I've always been a big reggae fan, and from the 60s, actually, because in the 60s, uh, a lot of the older jazz musicians that I used to stand out of outside bars to hear when I was a kid, because I couldn't get in, I, I got to know, and they would go over to England, and in those days, it was no blacks, no Irish, no dogs in the guest houses. So, a lot of the jazz guys, when they got jobs in England, traveling with jazz bands and stuff, but they are working in studios. They lived in the same areas as a lot of Jamaicans, and they used to come up back to Belfast, and would give me these seven-inch ska and blue beat records, which I was in heaven, because it was a big clip so far. And in 1965 or 66, uh, the Wailing Wailers' first record, One Cup of Coffee, came out. And it was Bob Marley's first record, and I played it one afternoon at Jazz Club. And it completely cleared the floor. So I've had a, a big interest in ska, and, and, and I was a big collector, and set up the Belfast Reggae Society. Uh, did regular gigs up at Queen's University every week. And I was in Dublin with John Peel at a 24-hour festival called Dark Space. 
and some of our bands, Rudy, Protex and all were playing. The Electric Prunes were playing. Uh, radiators from Space, can't remember everybody. But there's this band, black and white band, called Zebra. And John Peel said to me, you should put a, put a record out for him. And I did, I don't even think he played it. And we put out 1,500 copies, 12 inch, 149, and we couldn't give it away, so we couldn't. Well, it just seemed like that, we couldn't give it away. Uh, and then, about a year and a half ago, a Japanese collector paid 700 quid for one of them, so I've got two in the house, if anybody wants to give me, give me a bid for it. And in fact, I didn't have one until quite recently, uh, two years ago, uh, at my annual 40th birthday party. Somebody, somebody <laughs> give me one. And a, their father's holy Bible. Ex-punk, give me his, very religious now. Maniac um, Mal, give me his father's holy Bible. It was, um, it's just such an interesting record because obviously Good Vibrations is so known as a, a punk label, but it's fascinating to see, you know, an Irish, an Irish well, well, we, band. We did bring reggae bands yeah. we brought back over to, to um, the Heart Bar. We also brought who had met Shane McGowan <laughs> over for his, uh, his first gig in Ireland. Shane worked uh, in a record, a record store in Soho Market with two friends who were in the Esoteric Music Society in the 60s, uh, Phil Gaston and Stan Brennan, and he worked with them. That's where I first met him. And then he formed a band called the Nipple Erectors, and, and I brought him over for a gig in the Heart Bar. And a few nights before, he phoned me up and he said, Try what will do and get the Belfast with the band, keep their, keep their heads down. I said, no, when you get the Belfast, yeah, there's only one thing you need to know. So how to keep your drink down. <laughs> sort of words that I regret. And then we brought over people like The Fall. I mean, it was a pretty experimental. I sort of like, I call it the punk workshop down in that. But uh, we brought over a monochrome set uh, in their very early days. Uh, well, over a few bands, but... Uh, my favourite nights in the hard bar, best remembered, is our own bands, really. Yeah, and um, on, also on the, the theme of reggae, I know that um, before Good Vibration started up proper, uh, you were playing on pirate radio in Ireland, and you were mostly playing a lot of, of reggae records, but there was one night in particular uh, when you were playing in, I think, I'm assuming in the jazz bar that you're talking about, um, in 1965, and you played uh, a Whalers record, Simmer Down, and there was two quite famous men at the time in the crowd. Do you remember this? No. No? Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully jog your memory with the track. Now that's um, the Whalers simmer down, but um, I'm doing a segue into this because I think this is one of the possibly most interesting, strange stories I've heard about you so far, and I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, I that I will I hope I can jog your memory then. You tell episode. me the story. Okay, I'll tell you a story. Um, two uh, footballers, George Best and Johnny Giles, were in the crowd, and Johnny Giles had never heard ska or reggae before, and ran up to you demanding to know what it was and then through you became friends with Bob Marley which is pretty well, interesting um, yeah I after uh, after I treasured uh, Bob Marley's first record I uh, I wrote to him kind of Capenstown Jamaica and three months later I got a letter back from him he told me his father was Irish well, I mean, if you look at Jamaica and look at the map, there's places like Antrim Springs, you know, because we used to send a lot of convicts from out here right to the, to the plantations and stuff, and as they did to Australia and all. 
So there's lots of places in Jamaica which are all named after places in Northern Ireland. And uh, Bob wrote back to me, and then we started to correspond, and we didn't meet until the uh, 70s. And I met him one night, and he said to me, uh, in a flat in Ballamy, and he, he said to me, uh, I believe you're from Belfast, and I says, actually, I am. And he says, uh, do you know this weird guy, Terry Hilly, takes his glass eye and puts it in people's pints of skin, isn't he? No, I've never <laughs> heard of him. And the next day he was in, uh, it was the time of Catch a Fire, and he was in, he was in the office, he was having an argument with Chris Blackwell because he wanted to go back to Jamaica, he was missing the family, he was missing his son, it was raining. And everything was going great for them, they got the old grey whistle test, they were getting rave reviews. And I think he wanted to cancel the last two gigs in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and Chris Blackwell said, you, know, you can't do this, you know, we've got a contract, you'd have to get doctors to tell you're ill and all. And Jumbo, the guy who worked there, uh, came out and he says, look, I, I get my wages at the end of the month, but we put a lot of effort into this. So, and I know it would break Chris' heart if you cancelled the rest of the tour. He says, but my biggest problem is your biggest fan in the world is down in our press, press department. And I want you to come down and meet him. He says he's stealing everything. And right now, I all the press releases, photographs, and I'll get my hands on. And he walked in and Jumbo says, I want you to meet. And he says, I've already... I've already met Terry Judas Iscariot, Hooley. He says he had taken me for a pint. And Bob didn't have much money, so he didn't. So <laughs> those days, it, it wasn't easy. Like you have now mobile phones to get in touch with anybody. I had to phone Mitt's wife, and she had to go to his work and tell him that Bob Marley. And he sang Bob a song <laughs> of uh, Concrete Jungle, the first track of the album. And Bob was very plain. He turned around and said, Tommy, why don't you do me a favour again? He said, that was never very interesting, but never play one of my songs again. <laughs> and uh, it was a lovely man, and recently, Stuart and I were down at the Whalers gig, was doing support, and what a disaster that was. I mean, it was only family man, Aston Barrett, and met Peter Toys, Carlton Barrett, and Bonnie, love. Um, and it was, to go out as a Whalers to me is an absolute disgrace. It should be done under the Trades Description Act. So I went down and, I did me, me hour set and was home at half eight. And that was unbelievable for me. It wasn't half eight in the morning for a change. <laughs> but um, just trying to pull through the, the, the theme of reggae again, it's, that it's to show really like the breadth of everything that you've been interested in for so many years and what's influenced the label. Um, and I just find it fascinating that you would start off, you know, selling records in your room then having the record shop, playing pirate radio, um, even going across the border to play pirate radio, yeah. play reggae records. Um, it really is just like a testament to like the breadth of everything you've done. Um, I, I, I used to go over the border every Saturday night to do pirate radio. Well, um, I know Mathan, famously in Kiss FM and Monaghan, preaching love, peace and understanding into the Black North eventually worked, but not, not through my radio show. <laughs> but I was, it was really funny. And, and the British Army used to stop me and go, Terry, you're playing a record for us? And I said, you have to write in or, or whatever. And then one night, they held me back for two hours. And then I, they were putting on, running around the station, they were putting on UB40 and stuff. And I, and I went in and I said, what's the next record? And they said, living on the front line. And I had, this here is very especially for David, Paul, and all these guys living on the front line in, in Middleton. And that's where the checkpoint was. And then they say next week, I could have smuggled anything over that border. Where you go, Terry? <laughs> so, in fact, one night the car broke down and they fixed it for us. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it wasn't anything against the British Army. It's just like phone up or whatever. Um, um, you've always you've always liked to cause a fuss uh, at your shows, though. I, I um, remember... It. There was one night in particular where you announced to the crowd at the end of a gig of yours that you were going to play the national anthem, and uh, and they were like, "Couldn't possibly! You the can't do that! You can't do the, that!" The manager of the venue ran up. He didn't know which which one of the two I was going to play. And uh, and 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 this is what you played. <laughs> I stopped him in his tracks. He was just about to go for me, and he went, "All right." <laughs> Right through the night I'm gonna come 
bit like that when he did the ceremony being faded out a little bit. It seems a shame to cut that off. Um, what I didn't realise at the time, because, well, what happened was a friend of mine, Bernie McEnany, who was at the art college, gave me a demo of the, of the undertones, and I, I played it and played it, and I thought there's something there, and, and a lot of friends come around the house, and nobody liked it. And Ricky Flanagan, a friend of mine, used to make the best pot gene in Belfast up in the Royal Hospital in a basement which was guarded by the British Army. Well, he actually, he was born out in Malaysia. His father had been something big in the, in the Army. And he, so he had a security pass, and he just speak like, a really good pod scene, but I wouldn't want to drink any of it nowadays. And at half three in the morning, I was playing the under tape, and Ricky went, just I'm going to see what you, what you like about that band. There was other friends who were in bands in the 60s, and I thought they would have liked it, and, and he didn't. And we didn't have much money, and I wasn't sure quite what to do. And I was going to sign up another band. And I was going to meet them in Lavery's at tea time. And they sort of had a manager in a van, and it's a, a bit more like Elvis Costello and Attractions, and I quite liked them. And uh, Bernie came up to me, and he says, I'm going up to Derry, what are you going to, what are you going to do? I want to tell this band, they're about to break up if you don't put out a record. And I went, Jesus, right, I'll tell you when I get across the, the road at Zebra Crossing. And I went to uh, tell him we're on the label. We're going to do it. So then I went up to Lowry's and I was really worried. I went, what will I tell this band? I said, oh, that's, don't worry about that, Terry. We're waiting to London to make it big. And your, your, your label will be too small for us anyway. So I was kind of quite relieved. I didn't want to disappoint them. But then I went, well, we're not good enough for you. So then we, rec we brought them up to Queen's University to play. I had, uh, it, was very, it was very difficult for us to get gigs. We used to hire out hotels and tell them it was somebody's 25th birthday party and then they found out it was three punk bands. They were either went. You must have got barred from pretty much every venue in the city after one gig in each one, pretty much. Uh, no, well, uh, I did get barred from Queen's University for life because I got all dressed up and I went up uh, one lunchtime and I went up to the office and I said to this young girl, I says, uh, her name's Terry Hooley from the Belfast Music Society. We would like to put on a concert in the McMorty Hall, which is now called the Nelson Mandela Hall. And um, and we girl obviously was taken over while the woman who did the job was on her lunch break. And she thought we were Queen's Classical Society and gave us the McMorty Hall for five pound. And I went, are you sure? Are you sure this is right? And she says, oh no, there's your receipt. It's in the book. Nobody else can get the hall. See, when Queen's found out it was seven punk bands called the Battle of the Bands, I tried everything to stop it. And I actually had the local health angels doing security, you know. And I tried to stop getting gear in and all. And it just, bouncers were really nasty. So the gig went on, and it was a great gig. And it was, we raised money to set up Just Books, the anarchist bookshop in Wine Tavern Street. And um, it was a fantastic gig, you know. Was, and it was the first time the undertones came up and, and played. And I think they went into the studio and recorded Teenage kicks it the next day. But Queen's sponsors gave me a terrible time. So what happened was the kids didn't like this, so they put in a few windows at the front of Queen's. <laughs> There's no trouble inside the gig whatsoever, except the roof wrecks thought this is the biggest gig we'll ever play. And they, they were, everybody had 25 minutes, half an hour at the most, to do their set. And you had to do your, to prove to the audience you were great in that time. And the reflex went, we we'll never get an audience like this again. And they played on, so I just went to Hell's Angels, right, lads? And they went up and lifted them off the stage. That was the only trouble we had that night. And then I got a letter from Queens. And I think it must have went up in the fire 10 years ago, because I, I tried to find it when we were doing the book, telling me that I was barred from Queens University for life. Not for a week, not for a month, not for a year, but for life. Well, it must have been a bit of a badge of honour to do that in, in the name of punk rock, I suppose. Uh, well, I haven't been barred from too many places, but I was definitely uh, barred from Queen's. And then the next gig I went, the, the bands, to, it was some band over from England, I think Rudy were playing. Might have been the adverts or something, and uh, so I sneaked in the back door. <laughs> so when it comes to um, the legacy of Teenage Kits, because it's perhaps the story of it getting played on John Peel's show twice, which is the first time in like BBC radio history that ever happened and the legacy of the track, it's such a familiar track to punk fans, rock fans, pop fans, it's such like a legacy record. When you hear it played out here, um, what is it about 
you, I mean, because you must have heard it hundreds of thousands of times now, what is it about the track now that still grabs you? And is it the same as what grabbed you when you first heard yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I have, I have many versions of it. Uh, I have Novelle Vogue's version, the jazz version. I have Union Avenue. Who, when I first heard it in the radio, I thought it was Johnny Cash singing. Um, and it, sounds, it starts off with Ring of Fire and goes into Teenage Kicks. Uh, many bands have played it, like Green Day, R.E.M., did a, did a concert. Somebody else did it as an encore at uh, uh, Tenant's Vital recently, at Kings of Leon or something, I can't remember who it was. Uh, and it's just a classic little pop record, really. Mm. And, and the drums sound and all, it's just, it's, it sounds to me as fresh today, like Rudy did, uh, as it did all those years. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just that I'm not that much interested in what's happening in the charts at the moment, you know. Mm. Do you feel, um, as somebody who you've always ca called yourself, um, I'm a hippie and, and punk rock was your way well, of getting anarchist, back? that's what I yeah. am. But, and the reason why I call myself a hippie anarchist is because in Northern Ireland everybody likes to pigeonhole everybody. You have to be one side or the other. And I don't really have a pigeonhole box for hippie anarchists. So yeah. I want them to set one up and then I'll be in that box. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I asked. But I don't really know what my politics are. I mean... Uh, I was brought up very Christian by my mother and socialist by my dad and you know, I was brought up to believe that um, a lot of things, but to believe that I've got a brother in Melbourne, a sister in Priory and the whole wild world is mum and dad to me and we're all a family of man and we all should look after each other and uh, I'm not the worst person in the world, well, my girlfriend might tell you different, <laughs> I'm sort of in the words of the Shangri-La song, good, bad but not evil. I like, uh, I, th I think that's a good way to live. Um, I ask uh, how, how you feel about that kind of record and how you feel about still being a hippie anarchist because being, you know, so in love with the 60s and everything it symbolised and keeping that alive through the film and your book and everything, do you feel like you live in the past a little? Still? Oh, I do. I live in the past. And do you think that's for better or worse? How uh, do you feel? Um, in two, two minutes, this will be the past. No, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I absolutely have to have things to look forward to, you know. And then, I, last year I did the electric picnic and I was very nervous and I was sure I would go down well. In fact, it went down fantastically well. Uh, 3,000 people in the tent going bananas and me on stage running around like a three-year-old child but, but with a bottle of whiskey. And, uh, they, and I thought, quite an image. I thought, you know, that was just brilliant. But I'll never be invited back. And they sent me a letter, saying, an email saying, uh, we're very much inspired by your set, Terry, last year. We'd like you to come back and do a bigger stage this year. Oh, Jesus. I wasn't feeling well, but I was really looking forward to doing it. And... And I, I didn't get doing it because I had a very bad chest infection. And then I went off to Barcelona to do a punk gig. And then did nothing for three days. In fact, Stuart took me home <laughs> one night from Lavery's because we both do La DJ and Lavery's on a Tuesday night. And I think Stuart thought he's never going to see me again. <laughs> I was that bad. And then I came back from Barcelona and I opened my emails and there was an email from Electric Pigman and said, Terry, I heard you're very ill, and I was, you know, hope you're feeling better. And by the way, you're the first person we have booked for the Electric Picnic next year. So I know I'm going to be alive for another year. And that is what's going to keep me alive, is knowing that I'll be back at the Electric Picnic. So I always have to have something to look forward to. So you'll not be getting rid of me just yet. In fact, I had my second week in this building, so I did. And last... January, I had my third and final week. I think I'd be pushing it, having a... I was a journalist said to me, when are you having your third and final week, or your third week? And I says, I've had two. I think it might be a bit pushing. He says, but I, the bloody two that you had were great. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, I think, is that, is that last about time? Are we at time? Yeah. Oh, is um, it about, does anybody want to ask me anything? Yeah. Um, we I'm not don't that frightening. Yeah, we don't. We don't. You don't have to ask me anything. No, no. Um, we don't ordinarily do it, but I'd be happy if anybody wanted to ask Terry questions. Anybody? Do you know what usually happens? And this happens all the time. 
people, especially when I was out in Cologne, there, no, I was going anybody else. The people were that frightened of me that <laughs> nobody would ask me any questions. So I started to ask myself questions, <laughs> and then answer them. And I did it in London at the at the, at the, at the and we had Brixton next. That was the funniest Q and A ever. Well, is anybody buying a drink? Still there? Um, any future Mrs. Hoolies with a big bank account? No. <laughs> You got £500 back in the day, you were doing fine. Uh, it was just um, just a mention to say that there is a screening of, of Good Vibrations, the film about Terry and Good Vibrations, uh, on Sunday at the Mac. Um, so if anybody's interested in seeing the film and seeing a bit more about the context of everything, you're more than welcome to go. Um, and I never understand why they couldn't get somebody good looking to play my part. Somebody <laughs> didn't drink and curse and be a madman, it's disgraceful. Well, I heard Michael Fassbender was a bit busy. I, you know? Well, originally it was going to be Michael Fassbender, so all, all my f female friends were going, like, Whoa. And then Richard Dormer did the pilot, and he was absolutely brilliant. He had me down to tea. And it, it's, it's just amazing. So it was, we, would have, we would have had a film out quicker. We would have got more big fans with a big name like that. But, it, I mean, I turned down two contracts 10 years ago before. It really took 15 years from beginning to the end to get the film and I, I never thought I'd be alive to see it. And then when I did see it, I thought, I really like this film, it's really good. It's warts and all. It doesn't make me out to be an angel, because well, I haven't been an angel in my life. I mean, I have been that bad, but I haven't been an angel. And I'm very proud of everybody who worked in the film. We had a great team. Uh, Nick, the editor, said we had a fantastic film that lasted two and a half hours. And it broke his heart to cut it down to 93 minutes. And I was really surprised that like, people like the Belfast Telegraph, before any, if anybody had seen the film, Belfast Telegraph was saying insiders in the music industry say this film's going to be big. And then when the film came out, I said, if there's had a half page in the Telegraph, if there's one thing you do this weekend, you've got to go and see Good Vibrations, the best movie ever to come out of Northern Ireland. So I'm very delighted with the success of the movie for not only the directors, David Holmes, producer Chris Martin and everybody um, in, in the film because the film's been seen, shown all over the world. The best reaction I've ever seen for the movie was, believe it or not, in Moscow. And I was out there for, for Irish Week and I built a bar called the Hooligan Bar <laughs> after, after my book. And uh, but that wasn't a plug for my book because I don't even have a copy and I've never even it's read it. It's not a plug, but it's a plug. <laughs> um, and I did DJ in it, and I let the Moscow punks take over, and it was just amazing. And I, I really enjoyed Moscow, but they were so enthusiastic about the movie, and they stood and clapped for 10 minutes and cheered. But it all got free Guinness and, and Irish whiskey beforehand, so I think that might have been a part of the reason. I think that might have helped. And then they clapped and clapped until I got up and spoke to him, and I was absolutely in tears, because I didn't expect a reaction like that. It was a bigger reaction than we got in Belfast. <laughs> All you get is, your movie's all right. <laughs> um, just another little thing. Um, also before that, there is Daniel Holmes' a short film. It's a premiere of A Light of My Eyes, which is on 15 minutes beforehand, and it starts at 3, forgot to say. So it's 3 o'clock tomorrow, uh, on, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so that's us. Um, did anybody want to ask any questions at all? No? Okay. Were, you, were you kind of hopeful for some? I'm down for a page. Oh, wait, hang on. I've got one. <laughs> right. Y you hang tight. Hi, Terry. Um, there's a great um, scene in the film, um, and I was just more a question, did, did it happen in, in that particular way where you've kind of made up your mind that you're going to open up the shop and I think it's kind of the IRA kind of come together in, in, a, in, a, in a bar and you ro rock on in, sit down and throw, throw the records on the top. Did, did it was kind of more a, a simple one. Is if it, if it ha when it happened, did you kind of hand pick the records in the hope that you know I'd pick some really really good ones, or did you just pick all the crap that was lying in the at the at the bottom of the basement? It was, it was a, well, actually, it was a really drawing after my book came back and the Irish Independent or something or Sunday Times or something, and it was talks about these guys came around looking for protection money, and somebody had given me all these uh, demo records that they'd got. And there was all these like Philomena Begley albums and Irish accordion albums and stuff that we just knew we wouldn't in the shop. So I, I gave them, the, I said, take them, we have no money in the till, take those records, sell them, and then you get some money. And uh, 
<laughs> the cartoon was of a guy with Bally Clava in the bar. Buy one of these albums or else. <laughs> But so you did uh, you did have to kind of pers um, obviously that is a scene in the film, but you did have to persuade a, a, a paramilitaries on both sides essentially to leave the business alone because um, it also was on Great Victoria Street and it was the most bombed street in Europe for a while. So the, obviously opening up the shop was quite a, a potentially a, a fraught process. It wasn't just like opening the doors. There was a lot more politics to it than that. Yes, yeah, so it was because we. we well, Dave Hindman and I had been friends and when I was doing hippie magazines in the late 60s and we, we tried to set up in 1971 the Belfast Arts Lab, sort of building like this and uh, went on with success. It was eventually an arts lab set up, but it didn't last long. And the thing that came out of that was the printing press that Dave had. And Richard, we, we've been trying to get a building to, 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 and eventually we got the shop in Great Victoria Street and I wasn't sure whether the record shop would work or not. And it was, well, it was just, it was just a hub of activity. And you look back at some of the footage and, and Chell Shock Rock, and there's just so many kids in there on a Saturday. And bands were formed in the shop, and people met in the shop, got married. And uh, it was a good shop for partying in as well, because we had all the good music. But it was, a, it was difficult, and, I, and then it was, uh, I mean, Michael Hall, anarchist friend, says that, he he had actually he he had to leave the country and wrote a book about his world travels. We were both threatened and and I didn't leave. Um, and he says it was a time when Terry and I used to go and talk to the IRA and the UDA and we'd try to get them to you know see a bit of sense, you know. And then it was a time when it just went, don't ever come back, and you're you're our enemies. Was basically that. Uh, so it was, it was quite, um, you know, it could be quite nerve-wracking sometimes working there late at night and hearing a banging on the door and all, and looking out the window to see who it was. And there were times when people hit me and stuff like that. But and now, years later, a, a, a lot of paramilitaries have apologised to me for things that happened in the past. So I, 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 I haven't been attacked for a couple of years, and and. I love the ceasefire because it used to be attacked every month. <laughs> and the old bones can't take it anymore, <laughs> tell you the truth. And I'm more frightened now. Frightened of my girlfriend, actually. I, I mean, I found San Francisco. I'm more fr I, people say about how brave I used to be and all. I just think it was insanity, really. I'm not, and I'm not very brave these days. And I love Belfast. Gary Lightbody says I live and breathe this city. But I was, I was say, being in San Francisco, as an old hippie, thought it would all be wonderful and all. I didn't really like it at all. And I was so glad to get back home to Belfast. I really love Belfast people. I love people from Northern Ireland. And I'm very proud to be from Belfast. But to tell you the truth, and I think, I think people here are very generous and they're, and they're very caring. It's just the bigots and the racists that I don't like. But you have to deal with them too, I suppose. And I'm, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in the world. I never have. I, but I always realised as a younger person, especially when the troubles came, and a lot of friends. I mean, we had 40 friends, and we were called the tribe. I was the last man standing in Belfast. Everybody got up and left, poets, artists, musicians. And I always felt that if I left, you know, one, I would never come back, and two, I would feel like a traitor. But also, I love Belfast because it's so exciting. It's such a small city, and there's always something happening, especially now. I mean, 35 years ago, I wouldn't be invited to one gig a week. Maybe a Saturday afternoon in the pound. Now I'm invited to 300 things every week in Belfast. Just wish I had the energy to go most of them. Now a lot of them, admittedly, I wouldn't want to go to. But um, and there's so many young and exciting bands here. And I th I've always said this from the 60s, that Northern Ireland is such a small country. We have the best poets, painters, mu musicians, performers, of anywhere else in Europe. And then somebody phoned me up, Van Morrison's ex furniture phone last week, said, you know, you, I, just heard of, I just heard a couple of new bands, you're absolutely right. You, I know you've been saying it from the 60s, but we have absolutely fantastic talent in this country. And you think that people come out of the country, Seamus Heaney, Paul Brady, who Bob Dylan says one of his favorite songwriters, um, Van Morrison, just, I mean, all, all, all the people, you know, 
And, uh, and I'd, I'd like to think for most people you are, you are on that list for, <laughs> for, for modern Belfast history, definitely. And you're saying that you're proud of Belfast, but I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Belfast is very proud of you as well. No, so. Belf Belfast City Council uh, used, maybe to, not so. used to try and ban me concerts and all. And I was a pain in the ass to them. I mean, I, I laugh when I used to try and ban my concerts in the Ulster Hall. The IRA were blowing up the city. The Shangle Butchers were butchering pure Catholics. And uh, they thought punk was a threat. And then, a couple of years ago in Music Week, they put up a plaque for me. So, <laughs> and called me a cultural icon. The two-faced so-and-sos. <laughs> well, um, I, suppose, <laughs> I suppose being <laughs> important... <laughs> I suppose being immortalised like that is extremely fitting because you are you are quite literally part of the fabric well, of this city. The so. funny thing is that when we were doing all this, nobody ever thought that this would last and anybody would ever remember it. That was it. Plus the fact that we, many a time we thought we never we, we would never last the, the the week. You know, it's just. Uh, I mean, some Terry Gleason, the artist said Terry Terry lived on the Omer Road, and if you walk down the Omer Road, it on the right-hand side at night, it meant you were a Catholic. If you walked down the left-hand side, it meant you were a Protestant. So Terry and his ma merry band of men always danced down the middle. And that's one thing I'm very proud of, is I never took sides. And uh, and I just couldn't really... I did argue with many, many paramilitaries about working-class people going out and killing working-class people and stuff like this. And I'm just really glad it's all over, you know. Well, it is... Uh, uh, horrific days. Don't really want to be reminded of them, and that's why Belfast isn't quite the way it was in the sixties for me, because Belfast, and it's become very corporate. A lot of the, a lot of the old shops, the old bookshops, a lot of all, all, all changed. And of course, we have to move on, but Belfast is to me quite exciting at the moment, and it's we've gone through a really dark period, and you just couldn't get bored in Belfast at the moment. You know, it's just so much going on. If, in fact, too many festivals. <laughs> Actually, there is. Um, you're DJing tonight as well, aren't you? Yeah, with three yeah. house DJs, and I'm <laughs> really, really worried about it. So I'm well, going to uh, feel like a, a fish out of water. Yeah. What, um, what venue is that again? Sorry, tonight. Uh, e Ether and Echo, Ether and, and it's Echo. 10, 10 o'clock. So I think I'll go on first. <laughs> and don't ask me what I'm going to play, because I haven't a clue. Well, um, if, you, if you fancy carrying the party on till later on, you can come and see Terry DJ with everybody else. I think we are going to have to wrap up. I could listen right. to you talk all day, but we are going to have to keep to a bit of time. Well, I hope you weren't too bored. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't come along and listen to some old Egypt talking a lot of her nonsense. All right. Oh. I thank you, you Lauren. You're saying, oh, oh bless you. T Teddy Hooley, everybody.